All right, well, I'm excited to get this group together again to talk about some interesting topics related to systems thinking, obviously. Um, one of the things that we've been reading about and hearing about and talking about is this concept of diversity in the field. And one of the things that I think is one of the strengths of the field is there's a, a diversity of really um, fantastic frameworks, methods, models, and approaches to various types of problems. And then the question remains, is there some universality that underlies them? And is it important? Is it an important topic that we should talk about uh, as a group of practitioners and thinkers for the field? And I guess that's sort of what I would say should launch this conversation yeah. specifically. Um, it's a big question. It is a big question, but I think it's a good question to ask. So how should we start? How should we start? Who wants to go first? Gerald, do you want to give give a, a little ditty? Um, okay, so uh, I guess I could start by saying that I've changed my mind on this over uh, a period of time. Um, so I think where I started out um, around late 80s, early 90s, was resisting any notion of universality because of the fear that it would... Uh, oppress the diversity. And we were in a, a time in the systems community where there was a paradigm war between um, sort of hard and soft or science versus design or however you want to frame it. There are lots of different framings. And, um, and I've, I've, I passionately believe that you need both and that you can relate them together. And anything that, um, that severed those things um, was only going to be dealing with half of what's possible or even less than half. Very often it used to be sometimes one methodology was supposed to be able to do everything. And um, that seemed to me to be wrong. Um, and the idea of creating um, a kind of unifying theory um, was potentially a problem. Um, so I, I started off like that. And then I went through um, a period where for my PhD, I put forward one. And then I had a, a reflection on it, changed my mind again about 10 years later and said, um, actually that was um, not a universal theory. It was um, a culturally appropriate theory. It said something about the different branches of uh, systems thinking that there are and reflected that in the theory. Um, and now I've come round again to thinking it's necessary. But the reason I've come round to thinking it's necessary is because the diversities continue to grow. And we're now in a situation where it's actually impossible to be faithful to that diversity and have a simple enough story about what systems thinking is to um, attract a newcomer to the field. Um, and we must have that. Uh, if we haven't got that, the field will ultimately die. Um, it's, we must have an ability to do an elevator pitch. And, but what that needs to do is um, be sufficiently simple, but have enough hooks in it that it will take people on to all that diversity without reinterpreting that diversity so strongly that it stifles it. Um, and I think that's possible actually to have that kind of theory. Interesting. Can I um, can I throw something into the uh, into the equation? Yeah. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the examples I'm thinking of, um, I, I, I think I agree with Gerald. I think diversity is important, but there are some uni universal things as well. I, I think if we look at the strategic development goals. Um, very few people actually disagree with the goals, but where they start to disagree is on the path that they decide they want to take to the goals. So you, you get that diversity starting to come in at that point. What I'd like to understand better myself is that you have a universal theme, you have those diversities trying to approach those universal themes. Isn't the interface between the, the universal, yes, we agree on these goals and the diversity about how we're going to get, isn't, isn't that where the interesting work lies? I think that's the thing that I'd really like to understand. 
Yeah, I, I, I if I understand your your question, Peter, I, I think I, you know, it's funny, I, I agree with everything Gerald says, I think we come at it from a different um, perspective. Uh, I think Gerald's thinking about the field and maybe socially and, uh, you know, what is good for the field and what is necessary or needed for the field and things like that. And I agree with all those things. And, and I think those things too. I sort of think though, a little bit more existentially of that there's all this diversity out there and that diversity has like real pragmatic things associated with it, right? It's system dynamics, soft systems methodology, you know, all these different methods and approaches and, and uh, ways of doing things. And they're all very, very powerful and they all do certain things really, really well. And it's a good tool for a certain job. And the question really um, is, is what is the, you know, the, the, the Gregory Bateson question, right? <laughs> the, <laughs> what is the pattern that connects, right? And so I, I don't see it as like, we need to do universality. I see it as there is universality. There is a pattern that connects all these different uh, methods. And we want to discover what that pattern is. Whether we need it or not is sort of secondary to me. What's primary to me is that it, it, it exists. It's there. There's some pattern that connects all these things. There's some reason that all these things came to the same party and exist under the same tent. And I am curious to know what they all share uh, together. So to me, it's more about the connection between universality and diversity is just what are the patterns that underlie the diversity? Yeah. I think that's a fine endeavor um, and, and a great addition to the diversity. <laughs> um, because I, I think that that's the way of things. Um, I, I really, I, I just want to pick up on two things. Gerald said um, the diversity has continued to diversify. Um, and and, and that, that seems to me to be in the nature of things. And by the way, that may be a universal rule um, that, uh, that, that <clears throat> the universe adds layers um, uh, and it adds layers um, of context that turn the meaning of facts into different things from different perspectives for different people um, at different times. Um, and you went for a, a Gregory Bateson quote, as I guess is going to be traditional in these calls, which is, which is great by me, that we might also look at the difference that makes a difference. Um, I, I absolutely agree that we can find and it's valuable to find um, connecting patterns. Um, uh, my view is that they will always be abstracted from the context in which they're situated. And we, you know, lovely example of the conversation between, you know, you acknowledge and respect Gerald's perspective of situation in a community of systems thinking. Um, uh, and therefore they create their own context, that they're, they're not context free, that they're, they're not, um, they're, they're, they're universal in as much as we and you can apply them to a whole range of things from a particular perspective in, in, in a particular concept. And they can be, they can be really valuable for that. Um, what, what concerns me um, is the risk is to say that is objectivity. That is, sci that is scientism. Um, uh, and that we, um, that we might lose uh, the, the layers and the context that, that, that give that meaning in different ways. Um, uh, there was something else I was going to say, but it's escaped me. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. But I, 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 I just, I just think we're, we're always going to be stuck with lots of universality and lots of diversity. Um, and that's a good thing. Yeah, uh, I think I'm, gl I'm glad you framed that as a risk because I think the concern I've got is when um, when, it, when science becomes scientism, if you like, um, or when you have the kind of old-fashioned neo-positivist view of science that all science is, is about pursuit of truth. And those, that notion of science that brackets out um, notions of rightness or subject to our understanding, the observer participant is bracketed out, um, and then universality becomes the only goal that, that then becomes oppressive of a whole set of, uh, a whole type of other types of knowledge. Um, but then 
it's up to us to make sure that that's not what systems thinking becomes, um, rather than say, uh, we can't talk about universality. Um, and then it's one of the reasons why I actually started by introducing context, because I don't think um, universality is about removal from context. It's uh, 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 any, any, so any claim to universality has a context and you are in some other context and it won't even be relevant. And the notion of relevance is absolutely critical. Um, so you, you, you're, um, you've got a claim to truth in a context of relevance. Yeah, the, the, the context of universality is, is its universe, whatever, whatever the defined universe is. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> That makes sense to me, and I think when we get into that science, is the other thing you touched on is we need we need we need elevator pitches, we need introductions, um, and and I think that's right. And I, I want to float into this conversation. Um, it sounds pejorative, and and, and I, it shouldn't it, it shouldn't be taken as such. The concept of lies to children, um, which I've just looked up, um, was first in uh, the collapse of chaos, discovering simplicity in a complex world. That sounds, uh, that sounds like an intriguing title, doesn't it? But uh, popularized when the same authors collaborated with Terry Pratchett in the science of disc world. <laughs> and life, life, sorry. No, I was just gonna ask who wrote that? Jack Cohen nice. and Ian Stewart, apparently. Oh, they oh. did it, they did it. I knew that they were, I knew that they were planning to do it. There was a lot of talk about that and then it never happened. So they obviously did it. That's apparently, in, apparently in 1999, they did eventually. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but I mean, that, that lies to children is, is, is defined as a simplified explanation of a, of a complex subject as a teaching method for children and lay people. And, and for me, um, the again, it's, it's the risk, isn't it? You know, if, if that is it, if that is all there is, we lose the richness and the depth. If that is an invitation to come in deeper into the waters, <laughs> then, then, then fan, fantastic. You know, and if it's something that you can apply in all contexts, and that you can add richness to your to your thinking, then then so much the better. But you know, a Marxist critical theorist, well, almost every bl br brand of um, ideological philosophy ha has a theory of everything, doesn't it? A lens through which you can see and explain and understand everything to your complete satisfaction uh, within your own within your own mindset. Yeah, yeah I think I mean it's 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 certainly worthy to bring up the risks of. of you know, as, as Gerald described it, neo-positivist, old school, you know, universality. I guess, you know, Kurt Lewin said there's nothing more practical than a good theory, you know, and, and, and a lot of folks will criticize theory because they'll say, oh, well, it, you know, it's not, it's no good. It's no use in practical domain. Well, that's what they, what they mean is that's a bad theory, right? A, a theory that's not pragmatic. Is a is a bad theory. That's not in context. Not, a bad theory. That's not, that's not an <laughs> anti. That's not like uh, something negative about theory. It's something that that theory is incapable of doing. And I would say the same about universality, which is we can find all kinds of straw men that are negative examples of universality of what people called universality, but we shouldn't let that affect our desire for universality, because universality, if you look historically at science, has an immense maturing effect on fields, whether it be physics or chemistry or biology, psychology, sociology, economics, you, you name it. You, the search for and the discovery of greater universality has a maturing effect on field and fields. And, you know, systems thinking is either a gangly 18 year old or a 35 year old living in his parents basement but it needs some maturity you know <laughs> i mean i think that that one thing that i would like to bring in here is just the history and that i whenever i am working with warm data which is you know arguably a you know, part of the diversity the the bouquet of potential approaches to systemic work um, I like to start with the history. And I feel like that, that what, what is almost most painful for me right now is the risk of losing the history. And that somehow systems thinking is the new it thing. And everyone's got to have it. Systems transformation is the thing everything has to have in its, you know, grant proposal right now. I mean, 
speaking to the people in this room, do you remember how long and hard we have been trying to get grants that had the word systems in it? And now suddenly you can't do one without it. Um, so, so I think what is important for me about that is that in looking at, you know, back, you know, Smuts and William Bateson and people who before the turn of the century were talking about systems and interconnectedness and interdependency and in Western science, okay, obviously in ancient civilizations has been there forever, but but using the word systems and interdependencies and, you know, some of these, what I would call foundational characteristics. And complexity. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and so they, they, this is not new. And the people who were carrying it have been ostracized. They've been written out of history, you know, all sorts of stuff has happened. Um, and they were fighting eugenics. They were fighting fascism. They were, you know, they've been on, on arguably what I would like to call the right side of history for a long time of trying to, you know, take care of the oceans and the peoples and the, and, and so I, I guess, what I don't want to lose is, is not just um, the rigor of the discipline, but also the arc of the history, which for me includes the rigor of the discipline. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in a way, I think when you start to look at the historical, um, just the theories that came in, the people who brought them, the way that that happened, you get a kind of universality emerges from that. There's a story that is a unifying story. Um, and and it, it allows for the context. So, you know, right now there is a ton of, you know, systems thinking that honestly doesn't, it's, it's pretty mechanistic systems thinking. Um, lots of stakeholders and lots of perspectives, but not really much understanding of relational process. And, and I mean, I see it all the time. I'm sure you do too. And, and it's called systems thinking because it means there's lots of perspectives, but no relationship between them. And, and um, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about that because then when I come in and say what we need to do is some systems thinking, that's what they think is coming. So it's been kind of, you know, popularized as this, you know, like you were saying, Benjamin, the lies to children factor, the easy version, you just list the stakeholders and then you pipe in information from lots of different directions and then you find a solution that's a, you know, win-win. <laughs> and, and, and that ain't it, baby, that ain't it. So, so the history is important. And I think the history is where the universality lives as opposed to does it scale? right? Which could be perceived as the other end of what makes it universal. And yeah. I mean, there's good news from that point of view. There's a, a number of people actually um, rethinking the history of system science uh, and systems thinking, looking at the debates that, um, so one of my uh, PhD students, Orson Senal, for instance, is looking at Bogdanov, and um, of course, the Russians recovered Bogdanov a long time ago, but um, in the West, it's really only being appreciated really in the last 20 or 30 years. And um, when the Americans um, first set up general systems theory, they, they did it pretty much as a mathematical theory and neutering all of the rest of it. And, and they had the notion of systemness, if you like, as the core notion instead of processes of organization, um, which for Bogdanov was the core notion that, and he called that a universal science. Um, the, the recovery of that really, I think, can change uh, the meaning of what we're, do, what, of what we're doing. Um, there's a number of moves like that, I think, and there's a realization that the debates go back um, I mean, even if once you look at who Bogdanov referenced, it's 19th and, and, and 18th century um, monists. And um, so you really, you get a, a different picture emerging of what the foundations were. 
Yeah, it's interesting, Nora. You know, again, I I sort of like agree with everything you're saying, but I just think it's maybe a different. Uh, you know, it's it's very clear that that there's a lot of rich systems history, and that a lot of other fields are just sort of like colonizing it, and and that can be frustrating when you're in the field and you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> like we have all those ideas and. We've been talking about that forever, and you guys think it's new, you know. And and uh, but I think, I guess I I would the cause of that I think is where I would maybe differ is is I think that's a lack of universality that's causing that. I think it's an so do I. I think it's an abundance. I mean that's my oh, okay. that's mm -hmm. my point there. Yeah. 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 It's it's like an yeah. abundance of diversity that's causing that because systems thinking is everything, therefore it's nothing, right. and therefore no one can actually figure out what it is when they arrive at the field as a newcomer, they're just lost. Yeah, I think I think really, I mean, I came to this sort of later, you know, having been more into translational research and policy analysis and other fields. And then, you know, we sort of met and then I sort of started to understand the field. I mean, it's still decades ago now. Gosh, that was- Yeah, a couple of decades now. Wow, that happens fast. But, you know, I mean, I think for me, if you take the, if you take, for example, we teach students in public affairs, graduate students at Cornell, and we teach them about systems thinking, the history of it, what it is. And then we, we have, but you have to, at some point when people are new to it, you have to give them something they can grab onto that allows them to then understand and apply the, the many, many different methods or approaches or whatever you wanna call them that might apply to their specific problem, right? So it's, it's almost like it gives them a, a grounding or a footing to have one specific answer, like systems thinking across all of these things is fundamentally this, this, and this. And then they can approach a method that is specific to what they're looking at and have a better understanding of how to use it. Because if they can't use it, what, what's really the point, right? If they can't get some value of it specific to their context or problem, you're gonna lose people. And your answer to, when they ask you, what is systems thinking? Your answer can't be, Systems thinking is 2,842 methods, <laughs> approaches, and frameworks that uh, people use. Like that's not a sufficient answer. I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a foible uh, that I'd like to bring up. What you said, Laura, I, I completely understand that. I just think, do you need to say? Uh, I can't remember the precise phrase, sorry, but do you need to say systems thinking is, or systems thinking can usefully be considered as? Um, that's the kind of that's the kind of nuance that I would feel is important in 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 in, in that kind of presentation, um, uh, which allows the, there's something for me <clears throat> um, about richness, um, about circularity, about um, uh, the multiplication of, of worlds and perspectives and uh, interrelationships, which is just the thing that. Just turns me on, frankly, about systems complexity and cybernetics. Sorry to be to, to, to be so crude, but there's a little bit in my brain that's like, oh, this is the good stuff. <laughs> um, and and so and so I want to, and, and so much of this comes down to personality and positioning and and, and perspective. Um, uh, I want to share that with with other people. Um, and and I almost feel just that little flattening effect if we say this is what systems thinking is. No, I, I understand your point. I'm not sure that you have to be declarative and say it is X, Y, and Z. I do think you can, you know, how you want to approach that and, and all that. But I mean, if you think about literally, I spent 10 years in K to 12 schools in the US and I literally saw three, four, five-year-olds getting adept at the things that we would call, you know, systems thinking, taking perspectives, making connections, taking a cool. wider view, zooming in. Like if you can actually do that with four-year-olds, you can do it with anybody, but you do have to have some, like Gerald's saying, an elevator speech. You have to have something that you can distill where people can start. And then it's in their process of applying it that the nuances and the context and all of those things come in and the value becomes apparent. In my, well, that's my opinion. And, and again, I think that that's contextual. Yes. Right. So I, I and I love that you brought up the four year olds because I do the work with four year olds, too. And it's, you know, like I, I, I that is so important to remember that four year olds can do systems thinking just fine. You don't have to have a university degree to do systems thinking. That yeah. is ridiculous. I mean, sorry. I, 
I would actually, argue, <laughs> but I would actually argue yeah. that humans are born systems thinkers, then we train them, we train out, them of out of it. it. Like, I, I would I totally agree with you. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, but I guess part of what is being spoken to is the context of the existing appetite for solutional processes and, and problem solving um, groups in this moment in history. Okay, so let's mm. let's land ourselves in the time that we're in, um, and recognize that that's that's part of what what is what 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 needs to be spoken to because it isn't just that we need to be able to describe systems thinking with a universal lens. It's that it has to actually be coherent in today's world, which is which is based on how am I going to use this within the existing systems? Yeah. Right. So that's, that's not disconnected. And I think this is where Benjamin's point is really well taken. That, you know, is there, is there a risk of forgetting that that communication itself is being contextualized? Not, not based on universality. There isn't. Yeah. There's no why reason why, because because there's no reason why a universality can't take into account the things that uh, that Benjamin quote unquote gets turned on by you know like <laughs> there's no reason why a universality can't take that into account there's no reason why a universality can't say hey if the world truly is intersubjective and not purely absolutionist objectivity. Mm -hmm. right then then part of the universality of the world is perspective taking right like that's what makes it intersubjective so so it's not that it's not that those things can't be built into the universality it's just that previous universalities haven't built them in and therefore they're not very good at capturing the universality so it's a critique of the instantiation <laughs> yeah. of universality versus the like i was saying earlier like a bad theory doesn't say doesn't speak badly of theory it speaks badly of that theory right so just because universalities of the past haven't done that doesn't mean that universalities of the future can't do that if you see something in the instantiations and the diversity like intersubjectivity being absolutely universal then that just becomes part of the universality can i take it um in a slightly different sideways direction. So one of my uh, ex-students, Jorge Velez, found um, a lovely piece of work in philosophy by Sperber and Wilson called Relevance Theory. And this sounds rather flippant, but there's quite a serious point to it. Sperber and Wilson said, something is relevant to you um, if, um, based on the amount of cognitive inference you can get from it, minus the amount of work that you have to do to assimilate it. And um, if what you're saying with systems thinking is that um, it is this extraordinary complex thing, then you can't really see the cognitive inference you can get from it, but you can see the vast amount of work it's going to create. <laughs> um, now, now, fair, now, yes. Yeah, now, you need to put that in context because the problem with that theory is it's all about individuals out of context making those judgments. Once you put it in context, you get a, You have to take account of what Nora just said. Uh, you have to actually be able to think about um, the situation in which people are uh, accessing that conversation about it. And also you have to think about how you can intervene in that wider context to make the context in which people think about inference uh, different. So um, for example, how do you actually expose those people to others who've had the physical experience of doing systems thinking? Because ultimately, until you've done it, um, you, you don't really get that feel for it. Um, how do you actually create an environment in an organization where, um, it's expected that you actually um, ha ha experiment with things and, um, and, and learn about these new things like systems thinking. I mean, that's what's going on at the moment mm. in, in, in sections of government in the UK, that you're actually getting systems um, units set up 
that are trying to create that context to make it easier for people to take 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 that step and be willing to do some of the work. Gerald, can I can I offer a psychological perspective on on some of what we've been talking about with a story that that I think follows on. <clears throat> Um, I knew a teacher once, a teacher of um, core shamanism, um, pure um, uh, appropriate cultural appropriation in a sense, but very open and straightforward and clear about it. Um, and he said that they used to tell a story that among the um, Coast Salish people, and I don't know if this is a true story, so forgive me if there's any Coast Salish um, uh, friends listening, to test if you were really a shaman, you were rowed out into the cold, dark ocean, uh, tied to a rock uh, and thrown from the canoe. Um, and those who could shapeshift into a fish or a penguin or a whale or a seal, those were the true shamans. And then, then, this, then this teacher paused for effect and he said, yeah, we lost a lot of good shamans that way. Um, <laughs> and if humans are born systems thinkers and mostly it's trained out of them, those who survived that training um, did so out of a peculiar mental toughness and perversity and rebelliousness and obstinacy and um, uh, maybe, sorry, I'm getting carried away here. Um, and, and that becomes a part of their identity. Um, and um, so I think we have to face the fact that we are, you know, we could borrow another relevant analogy of the wounded healers. Most of the people who are doing this stuff are carrying the, fl carrying something of being special and different and outsiders and on the edge. And that is a part of seeing uh, perspectives that other people don't see actually. So I think there's, you know, it's worth thinking about from this very COD psychology point of view. There's a lot of energy in the systems and complexity and cybernetics world um, of um, wanting to be different and special and the ones who have uh, the, the, the magic knowledge. And, and I think that's a really important Part of the picture as well actually. Yeah and um, just to think of that in terms of sort of systemic marginalization theory if you consider yourself sacred then there are bound to be others considering you profane because the two are opposite um, interpretations of the same marginal phenomenon. So. so this brings me perfectly to this this thing that I am wanting to throw in here to kind of see what happens which is that Okay, they're probably one of the best pieces of systemic work that I saw happen in the last couple of years was a, a, a song um, by this artist named Cardi B. I don't know if you're familiar with her work. And she released a song in the last year called WAP, oh. right? Do you guys, anybody with teenagers knows this song? No. Okay, the no. thing about... <laughs> But, but what's up with this is that this is this piece is it doesn't look like systems thinking it doesn't walk like systems thinking there's no one saying this is systems thinking but what's happening with that piece of music is it's actually going into the culture at a at a very abductive level and and creating um, wow a, a very transcontextual cultural shift that is has a, a profound anti-rape message that I've never seen any academic process ever address in the same way where I mean that that song you know is it sacred is it profane you be the judge yes. but but <laughs> the fact of the matter, yes right but the fact of the matter is is that the little girls are coming into a world right now in which um I mean WAP, it stands for wet ass pussy. So it's, Sorry, can I just it's, say, it's Laura, the Wikipedia. actually a, a cultural <laughs> mandate for, 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 for there to be, you know, for women's pleasure to be a, a prerequisite. Okay. This has never occurred in my lifetime. I've never seen anything like this happen. So this is a kind of systemic piece of work that, you know, how do we, with this notion of what is systemic thinking, how do we have within that the possibility of recognizing systemic work that doesn't look like it came in through the office door? And, and because it's about recontextualizing and reframing and um, all of those things, Wikipedia requires three footnotes um, uh, along this uh, for the single sentence, what is a raunchy, uh, and then it's got three footnotes next to raunchy. <laughs> 
um, uh, I I think it's uncategorizable. Um, you can explain it after the event, um, but you I don't believe you could plan it uh, if you see what I mean, or if you if you and if you did plan it, its effectiveness is that it's uncategorizable, that it comes literally out of left field from a different dimension, from a different framing and perspective. Um, and it couldn't have that effect without that. I, 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 would, I don't think so. I mean, I if you it's it, possible to tie together yeah. with what you said, Nora, which I'm going to stay away from, but uh, and what Gerald said, but I, Gerald said, talk about the complexity and people not wanting to, you know, have to deal with the work of the complexity. And I think this pro provides a, a real paradox for systems thinking as a field. And, and what you're saying is, I, I agree, but we have this idea of the iceberg and uh, in, in systems thinking, right? We all know it very well. And wh what we tell people is, you can't stay on the surface of all the instantiations and the events. You have to look at the structures and the mental models and the patterns that underlie those instantiation. Now, what you're talking about is one instantiation among many. It's a, it, according to you, is a great instantiation. But there's millions of these instantiations, and there's mil even millions more of the complexities of systems thinking. I think what we have to do is not simply simplify the complexity so that we can lie to children. I don't think we should lie to children. I think what we have to understand is that Com that systems thinking is itself a complex adaptive system. It's the emergent property that results. And so there are simple rules that underlie it. Yep. And all those instantiations, like the one you just mentioned, Nora, we should call those out as, as I'm sure we all have different ones, but we should call them out. But they're instantiations. And we should, we should actually apply systems thinking to systems thinking and look for the underlying patterns and structures and mental models that actually underlie systems thinking because there are simple rules that govern these processes. Well, and that's how you teach it. And that's not a simplification. That's, those are simple rules that underlie the complexity. Yeah, right. I mean, no, I get that. But I guess, I mean, part of it is you want, you want, we want to be able to teach people what it is, but also to actually do it. And you can't teach it if you can't distill it and explain it in a way that is practical and useful across those contexts, even, you know, a song like that. I'm sure you, you can, I mean, what I'm saying is you can apply a systems thinking lens to anything. We know that because of the variety of students that we work with all over the world who are, you. and I guess that's one of the things that I think is so remarkable and unique to system thinking as a field is that it, has such a wide range of um, application and relevancy and utility across other domains. And I don't think that, in other words, all of those methods and frameworks are useful not only inside the systems thinking field, but other fields, other domains. And so in order to really, um, for lack of a better word, um, extend the impact of system thinking, it's like you have to get to a, a point where you can sort of easily translate that to people so that they can imp they can use it in their context right or analyzing lyrics like that more like you know <laughs> right. it has but that has utility. context right you can only share that with certain people right, right? we can't share it with fourth graders and i probably can't share Ooh, it. We, we might get an r rating on our youtube channel uh, we'll see no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i mean you know if you can apply it to that you can apply it to anything. And I think that's like th that system thinking is like this forced multiplier of analysis that is, it's almost like a superhero, right? Because it can do anything, really, if you understand it and you can apply it. I mean, yeah. maybe. Uh, but, but again, this is, this oh. is perhaps an emotional tendency, but I, I, I do want to, you know, I want to say that the iceberg is a lie to children, that it's a physical um, instantiation of something which is much more nebulous. Um, I, I want to use the word nebulous um, a lot. I, I follow David Chapman's um, uh, approach when he and he's interested in meaning, um, and meaning is always context dependent. There's always an infinite variety of nebulous reality out there in which we see different patterns at different times for different purposes from different perspectives in different contexts. 
um, and so on. Steam is a better metaphor. Um, steam from water is a better metaphor than, than an iceberg, because an iceberg is a physical thing. It's a, you, you can mine it, you can analyze it, you can ping it with sonar. Um, uh, you can do that with, um, with physical systems. That's not you, a lie, that's a metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, and metaphors metaphors can be dangerous. Yeah. And and the fundamental metaphor of the well, I won't go into the models again. Me metaphors can be dangerous, and 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 I see some danger there, um, because, um, uh, you know, an iceberg isn't an ecosystem with niches and 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 um, uh, unraveling of of of, of different ways of of uh, it, an iceberg doesn't talk about. Um, uh, affordances uh, and the way that um, uh, one thing created in one context will suddenly be repurposed in another context, which is the kind of pivotal point that I think you know you, you're talking to Nora when you talk about that song being a, being an example of systems thinking. Um, so, exactly. yeah, it does you know, about it though because that's a pattern. Yeah. And it, you okay, know, if you look well, at events and patterns and structure and mental models, those aren't metaphors. Those are those are. Things. not nebulous terms those are those are real things in the real world that are being overlaid on a metaphor uh to ground it in something M but mental models are not real things in the real world <laughs> they're, they're... They are absolutely real things in the real world how, well, how do you I think we're having a know, conversation to to go back to um this thing though how would you know to recognize systemic work if someone was doing systemic work and they didn't come up and say, I'm doing systemic work, would you recognize it? And how would you recognize it? What would you look for? I mean, if we're, this is where I'm going with this question of, you know, not so much describing how I do systemic work and what the fundamentals are for me, but when I'm, okay, because I'm doing a lot of work right now with communities that are totally betrayed. And in those communities, one of the things I see again and again is, uh, you know, it, there's an aptitude for perceiving transcontextual um, process that I frankly do not see in more comfortable communities. It, you know, it, it's really easy to think that your, um, your comfort and your privilege was something that was created by you right? That you, your achievements are what produced it. And, and it's, it's, it's much, it's another thing altogether when you're perceiving um, poverty and pain to start to recognize that it's coming from multiple contexts and this, the capacity for perceiving systemic process there is much more on board. No vocabulary for it, but who cares? The perception is there and it's embodied. So, so what I see in, in some of those communities is that actually the way in which they want to respond to their situation is inherently much better and much more systemic work than the kind of imported systems thinkers are going to produce. Mm -hmm. And they don't even see what they've got in front of their face because they're, they're looking for a particular way and form and vocabulary of systems thinking and they're missing what's right there happening beautifully but that's so, that question well, that you're asking is precisely the type of question that you would ask of in order to look for patterns of universality which is if 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 first we have to decide what are the things we would call systems thinking when we see it so yeah. you would see this song and call it that and some mm -hmm. other what are these instantiations and what are the patterns that connect those instantiations so that so that we can't That's why I'm asking it. the instantiations. Okay. But I would yeah. say the patterns that connect are things like the, the folks you're talking about. They're they're understanding the difference between identity and other, and they're not marginalizing the other, right? They're making distinctions that don't always marginalize the other, whereas the groups that are oppressing them are making distinctions that do marginalize the other. I would say that the groups that are oppressing them are not taking perspective as much, or they're only taking their perspective. Whereas the, oh, the groups on, are talking hold on a second. more perspectives. I, I think you misunderstood my question. Yeah. So my yeah. question is, in in say you're you're trying to give a, an elevator pitch on what is systems thinking. Okay. So part of that is how you would describe it, but another part of it is how you would recognize it what it is you're looking for yes okay so 
So because so that's really the question in in the in the if you want to create a universality a, a description that is there, what are you looking for? That's what because it's, it's going to come in a thousand shapes and sizes. No, but it, but underneath it's not under. It's only coming in a thousand shapes and sizes as instantiation. Underneath, it's about not marginalizing the other. That, for example, not if you marginalize the other, you're not doing system thinking. Yeah. Well, I mean, for me, I would say first off, it's something that is actually. Um, coming into a response to multiple contexts simultaneously. Perfect. Yeah. Right. So that would be something that I would say, you know, that, that, that there's a, you know, there's a, a, a gender question, there's a violence question, there's a um, history question, there's a whole, you know, question about, um, you know, politics. There's, so there's lots of different contextual processes that are being addressed simultaneously. And that's one thing that I'm looking for when I see systemic work kind of come from the ground accidentally or from, right. And, and it's so, so I'm looking for a response that shows that there's perception that can both zoom in and zoom out on multiple processes taking place simultaneously. Right. So yeah. zooming in. What and happens with it could be anything. Zooming in, zooming out is just a part whole function. Perspective is a contextual changing function. Identity other is a is a boundary navigating function, and and relationships is a the multiple, is, is the multiple interdependencies. dynamical interdependencies function. Yeah. And you mix and match those until you have you know what you call context, which I frankly think we should bar the word context because context is just like a it's like a, a dumpster that we can put everything we don't know what it is in and call it context. But context, is, if you think about what text is and you think about context, the context to any text is just more text. True. So context isn't this magical thing. Context is all the relationships and other stuff that that thing is with. It's not a magical cloud form or anything like that. It's, it's, it's you know, other stuff that's with that thing. I mean, essentially, it's sort of like a, I think of a context as a kind of ecology. Of, right, but what's of, ecology? Ecology is a bunch of stuff that relates to each other, that has hierarchical groupings in it. That's in, perspective. yeah, interdependent communications and relationships yeah. that are, you know, wound together. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, I, I think that context is a useful word. I, I'm not going to throw that word out, especially because I, I like what happens when you start to see multiple contexts yeah. and allow them to be um, in, in communication with each other. So, you know, there's in one context, I am a mom and the, the whole patterns of communication and interdependency and way that I am myself and relate in others and, you know, whatever is happening in all of those processes is very, very different than the way my microbiome, for example, is in communication and relationship with the ecologies that I live within. So those are two different contexts, but they're absolutely interdependent. You can't actually take them apart, but it's important to be able to, um, to, to have inquiry around the different sorts of communication that are taking place there. Right, but those contexts, like you said, they're actually made up of ec ecological systems, made up of stuff, made up of interrelationships. Each one of those stuffs mm -hmm. and each one of those relationships themselves can have perspectives and, and they can be nested inside of each other and they can have boundary issues and all kinds of things happening inside that context. So to say that two contexts have to be together is really to say that two ecological systems made up of distinct parts and interrelationships and nested holes and perspectives from all of those parts and relationships and nested holes are coming together. And that is not communicated by saying two contexts that most people just think context is like the thing that surrounds yeah. the, the object, which is really a mis, misappropriation yeah. of what context is. Yeah, context I mean, I think- isn't for that object, that context is, is more objects. 
or relationships. Right, probably. which are which are objects. But I think it's I think it's always this question of well, where's the edge? And the edge is where you draw it. Mm -hmm. yep. And you know, uh, that's was, the thing. Yeah. Go yeah, ahead, Gerald. Uh, now I was relating this to um, boundary critique in my in my mind as you were talking about it, both of you, because I think one of the critical mistakes that you see um, in some literature about boundaries is the idea of transcending boundaries, as if you can some, some, mm. somehow be in this uncontextual space. Um, you, you, the only way you can transcend a boundary is by having another bound boundary because you can never have that God's eye view. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I tend to use the term different boundaries rather than different contexts. Although I do agree with you that context is still a useful word because we move from one place to another. But, but even with boundaries, you have the issue of you, you, those boundaries aren't just occurring on their own. They're, they're occurring because of perspectives. And so you can't have a boundary without a perspective. Yeah. And those yeah. things are like coupled oscillators. One isn't happening b before the other. It's happening at the, they're simultaneously kind of reinforcing each other like flies in a forest that are blinking. And then suddenly they blink in oscillation. So in order to understand how that boundary forms, we have to, we have to get to something more fundamental than just vagaries. Well, I mean, I, I had this issue when I was working on this Samathesy concept of trying to figure out, oh my gosh, what should we call the parts? Because the second you get into describing parts and holes, things can get um, very, you know, it, the system becomes an arrangement. Right. And, and in fact, system, the word comes from arrangement. So uh, how to, I was trying to kind of get beyond that with that somathesy concept into, into what happens in, in mutual learning in, in, in living systems as a way just to kind of pull that out and kind of pull it into the foreground. And I couldn't figure out what to do because every time I started to think about parts and holes, this boundary issue is it, it it's a conundrum. Um, and so I just said, well, okay, so what am I actually talking about? Is it, is it, you know, entire systemic pieces like my nervous system or, you know, I could, I could lose my hand and I would still be alive. If I lost, you know, other systems, I could continue to live. So what would it be? What is that? And so I thought, well, maybe I'll just call them like vitae. They're just like something alive, just some life. So there's living process there, but it was a total failure. <laughs> I couldn't get anybody to do it. And, you know, it just trying to get beyond parts and holes is such a disaster. And to me, it just always comes back to the edges where you drew it and the kit, the catch is not to forget it. Well, and, but around that conundrum, I think one of the mistakes the field has made a lot is to think of boundary conditions as the edge of the system and mm. not to realize that every single part, every distinction, every relationship in the system is a boundary condition itself. There are fractal boundaries going on, all of which have perspectives. So when we draw parts, those are yeah. just as boundary condition as the whole is boundary condition. And it's yet, very clumsy. World, it's very the whole it's, it's, <laughs> it's a fractal of well, I mean, I would say it's a nebulosity and pattern. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, patterns, the patterns are created by by an observer. I was just sorry. I was just thinking, reflecting back on the iceberg, and this conversation we're having now tells us one of the weaknesses of the iceberg metaphor, because that iceberg has the instantiations at the top, and then it has the structures, it's got the mental models at the bottom. These are all interrelated. They're all implied, uh, they're all implied in the other. You, you can't take the mental models out and still have the structures. That's right. um, they're all interrelated. And that, that layer, that layering doesn't show that. And by the way, the way we traditionally represent the iceberg, somebody, somebody did a really nice little, um, I don't know if you've seen it, <clears throat> little app where you can draw an iceberg of any shape. 
and it will then float into its actual floating position as it would in, in water. And the way the traditional systems thinking iceberg is drawn, I think quite appropriately is completely unstable in the water. So it would absolutely flip on its side um, as, as, it, as it's drawn and float on its side. And, and, and there is something about the, what, what I mean by affordances and by the application of one thing into another context, which can be through reframing, can be through re, you know, boundary critique, etc., is that what we think is at the base of the um, uh, iceberg can suddenly be at the top in a different context, in, in, in a different iceberg. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you're absolutely right, Derek, it's context it's text and then context and then context and then context all, all the way down. That's, that's the problem. That's the deep problem that we're all actually grappling with in, in, in trying to have this conversation, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we've, we, we've hit past an hour, so I don't want to uh, take us too far past an hour, but um, I, I will mention that Laura and Gerald and I recently published a paper on this topic called the four waves of systems thinking. So, uh, that might be something that people can take the next step with and, and, and learn more about, you know, at least where the, where the conversation heads from here. I'd, I'd like to encourage people to read my LinkedIn piece, The Universe is Griebling. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's definitely... Which I found a lot of fun. <laughs> a conversation that will continue, as always. Yes. 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 It's, not a com it's not a one and done. There's lots of dialogue to go, for sure. And it's lots of fun. It is lots yeah. of fun. It's lots of fun. And I, that's the thing for me is as we are examining the parts and the holes and the boundaries of systems thinking itself, um, that it stay juicy and fun and weird and, and alive <laughs> and, and not flattened into um, a particular notion that, that loses that richness. So somehow it's got whatever that description is. It's got to have, it's got to be able to hold Cardi B songs and you know weird things in it. It should hold weird things. Life makes weird things. It's how it keeps going. Yeah, yeah the weird things are in the diversity. Yeah, yeah. Can I just end on um, a, a positive note? I think it's been about ten years since anybody said to me, "What do you mean computing?" And there's, uh, even though, even though we know that there are lots of people with only a kind of superficial understanding of what systems thinking is, people kind of get that they need it, that there's complexity out there that they need to grapple with. And I'm certainly having more conversations now um, than I've ever had before um, with people wanting to, wanting to learn and wanting new things. So it's a good time. Yeah. Yes, the, the twin viruses are helping. Yes. The virus yeah. of COVID and the, and the rampant and worse virus of stupidity is <laughs> making it very clear that we need it. They're keeping us all secure in our jobs. <laughs> it's good for system it's thinkers, for I system guess. Thinking. Who saw that happen? <laughs> Who thought it would come? Well, here they would say we planned it, right? And it's a, it's a, it's a uh, hoax. Yeah, true. <laughs> That's not good. Well, thanks everyone for taking the time. Yeah. And uh, it's been we'll fun. wrap it here. Absolutely. <laughs> See ya. Very thanks. enjoyable. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.